Hey guys, Brad here from Scooter Street. Look, got a good one today. A little while ago we did a race engine build on an SR50R. Now we put the video out, we had a whole bunch of questions of people asking why we didn't do more uh, appropriate modifications to things like the intake and the electrical system of the bike to match the cylinder and the crank that we put onto it. So at the time we promised an update on the bike because it was getting a bit of a staged build, um, a different through a process of um, sort of attacking one part of the engine at a time. Now behind me, I've got the very same bike, which as you can probably see from the background is almost unrecognizable from the original bike that we did a build on. So it's obviously had a fair bit of work done. So today I'm gonna to go through uh, some of the components that we've installed and some of the things that we've uh, upgraded to match the rest of the engine that we did in the original build and um, sort of some of the performance advantages of these parts and the differences that they've made. So I'll rip into the bike, it's just behind me here, and um, we can see uh, what a difference it is. I apologize for the uh, amount of background noise, we're obviously not at the shop today, a bit of a difference in scenery. And one of the first things you might notice is obviously the bike is a completely different color. We've uh, had it fully resprayed, and um, it's difficult to tell without the sunlight directly hitting it, but um, it's like a, like a bronze pearl color, so it's really come up quite nice. Also done a um, like a naked handlebar conversion. Now it's still sort of in a bit of a build process. Uh, the majority of the stuff's been done, but um, we're going to get obviously probably a new digital dash for it and do a little bit more tidying up here to do. Uh, and on uh, on that same note, the majority of these black plastic panels have also been replaced because uh, these Piaggio plastics are really uh, synonymous for. Uh, with time and sunlight uh, getting quite faded and going quite a, um, a gross grey colour. Uh, in particular, these are SR50 tunnels. They tend to um, sort of crumble and fall apart over time. These ones have been sprayed black, but uh, obviously we're still waiting on that one from Italy. But um, the majority of them have been replaced. The bike also has a brand new seat. This is from a later model SR50R, which has a really nice... Um, sort of factory heat pressed Aprilia logo into it with that sort of carbon effect. It looks a whole bunch nicer than the um, the orange one that came on this particular model from factories. Now on the performance side of things, when we did the original build, it uh, basically had a, uh, a race crank and a race uh, 70cc MHR kit installed on it, a Bridgeport single ring kit. Um, now the things that we hadn't done at the time uh, were the transmission, uh, the intake system and the electrical system of the bike. So all of these have been addressed. You see it's, it's a little bit dirty. We've put a, um, a Delorto PHBG 21mm carb on it with a uh, Molossi, I think these are an E5 with a cover. I um, made up this neat little bracket, which um, just holds it because if you've had one of these on your bike before, particularly this is an aftermarket manifold, and the aftermarket ones are a bit um, softer rubber than the factory, or if you've got a really old factory one, they can also be quite soft, and you get quite a bit of um, sort of rattling around of the of the pod while it's moving. Obviously the factory airbox is bolted on and um, the intake manifold's bolted on so the factory intake system, the carb can't really move. It's captured between the two, the airbox and the intake manifold. But when you take the airbox away from it and the pod's just floating, they do uh, tend to have a bit of an issue of, and it did happen to this bike, going over a bit of a bump and the, um, the pod filter getting jammed down between the tire and the engine casing, which is obviously not what you want. So it's quite a cheap and uh, effective way of um, just securing that in there. That bolt there just sits into a little hole in the end of the cover, so it's not actually screwed, it's just holding it well enough that it can't move. And um, if you do need to change the jet or something like that, it is quite simple. Basically just undo the um, hose clamp on the back and it just pops in and out of place. It's not actually bolted, so it's quite handy. Now obviously the PHBG is a manual choke carb, so we've got, it's actually a Molossi kit, but Molossi use a Delorto PHBG in their kit. So it's got a manual choke there, which is just installed on the side. The idea with this, excuse me, is that you can have the choke engaged and um, sort of once you've ridden about 100 metres up the road, you can use your foot just to click it back off once um, the bike is heated up enough that the choke is no longer needed. Now I'm not going to pull the, the, uh, the cover off because it's a bit of a pain, but um, inside here uh, we have installed a uh, full Molossi MHR overrange transmission. So this is the full variator and torque driver transmission, the overrange, which uses a different belt as well, which it comes with. Now, um, uh, the, the big advantage with this transmission is it gives you additional lower gearing as well as additional high gearing because it has a larger diameter variator as well as a larger diameter torque driver or the rear pulley. Now, one of the things with this system that um, 
sort of isn't particularly well advertised by Molossi is once you install this, because it comes with the outer pulley for the variator as well, you're not able to run an electric start anymore. It's kickstart only. And the reason for this is the factory outer pulley has uh, teeth on the outside of it. Now, yes, between your starter motor, you have a pinion, and the pinion jumps out and grabs onto the teeth on the outside of um, the outer pulley, which is what engages the engine to start it when you hit the electric start button. Now, the, fact, the Molossi uh, overrange outer pulley doesn't have teeth because it's aluminium, so it's a little bit, little bit too soft. Um, it'd be too much of a danger of it stripping because it's aluminium. Uh, and so you're not able to use your electric start any longer once you do have an overrange kit. Now, although that's inconvenient, this sort of level of a build of bike is uh, you're embracing quite a bit of inconvenience because it's not exactly a, uh, a daily rider anymore. It's really leaning towards a, a road registered race bike at this point. One of the other things we've installed, obviously, is this beautiful Molossi Air Force cover. Now, you can also get a little red filter for the front of these, but um, the filters are really quite expensive, so the customer opted not to go with it. The advantage of the filter, obviously, is that if you're riding through dusty and dirty areas, or particularly if it's raining, because quite a bit of air does get sucked through here via that um, outer pulley to cool the transmission, if you do uh, run the cover, the, uh, the dust and, and water and that sort of thing is kept out. Now, as I mentioned, this uh, isn't exactly a daily for this customer, so uh, he's not at really any risk of riding through sort of dusty um, uh, areas or, or in the rain. He's certainly not going to be riding, particularly with a pod filter anyway. Now, on that note, you'll notice we've also taken the rear mudguard off. Now, the rear mudguard on these from factory does bolt to the airbox. So as soon as you remove the airbox and go with the pod filter, unless you're going to make up a bracket for it, it... Uh, basically can't be run and even then even if you do make up a bracket for it because the the factory airbox sort of comes up around this level the um the mud guard will impede with the pod filter unless you're running maybe a 45 degree pod or something but it was sort of all a bit too much mucking around so we just removed it looks a whole bunch cleaner and it is uh, quite easy to access the carby from both sides with that um with that mud guard removed now, coming around to this side of the engine, you'll notice that is not a factory stator. So obviously we've installed an inner rotor on this one. We've gone with the Molossi uh, Team 2 inner rotor. This is the brand new one. It's really, really lovely, beautiful quality unit. So we've got a couple of timing marks up here in case it needs to be removed because these are very particular in the way that they need to be installed because they're fully adjustable. Um, there's a sort of a whole process to installing these. If you're going to um, install one, I highly recommend that you either find a good video on it or a very, very in-depth read of the instructions because it is quite um, quite necessary this be installed the right way. Otherwise, the bike won't run properly. But um, this uh, has made an enormous difference to the bike. Uh, I um, installed this one myself at the same time as the overrange transmission, and I did one at a time so that I could see what difference each one made. Now, the overrange transmission made quite a big difference, particularly because we uh, also... Uh, which I hadn't mentioned, put uh, the Molossi primary and secondary gear up kits in this one as well. So making the gears a fair bit taller obviously affected the initial takeoff. So uh, the overrange transmission giving it that bit extra low gearing for the initial takeoff helped. But the uh, inner rider made an enormous difference. Now the reason for this is with the uh, the factory uh, stator, the this part here, which is actually the um, the the magneto or the flywheel is on the outside. Now it's quite a heavy unit. Now just the way centrifugal force works, because the heavy weighted mag mag magnetic part of the flywheel is on the outside, trying to get it to spin up is uh, quite a bit more load on the engine, particularly at low RPM. When you're trying to get that sort of nice snappy uh, fast initial takeoff, you're wanting the engine to be able to rapidly change an RPM from a low RPM to a high RPM, high RPM very quickly. Now that huge big um, flywheel, which is directly bolted to the end of the crank, provides a huge amount of extra load or resistance to the engine in wanting to do that. Now an inner rotor, as the name suggests, the weighted heavy flywheel component is on the inside with the stator component on the outside. So there's obviously a lot less load on the engine being able to rapidly change an RPM. And it cannot be understated how much of a difference this makes. Honestly, it made the biggest difference this thing is very difficult to keep on two wheels it's, uh, it's honestly relatively scary to ride and a big part of it is because of this having lots of power is one thing but the access to the power uh, is um is the difference between a bike that's rideable and a bike that's not rideable 
And uh, if you're going to put a high revving cylinder kit on a bike that needs to get to a high RPM before it starts making power, an inner rider is absolutely essential in being able to access that power in a way that's fun. Because uh, otherwise, off the mark, they're just really boggy and doughy and not really very fun to ride. So that off the mark acceleration is definitely what you get with one of these. Now the one drawback of an inner rider is that you no longer have uh, a stator which is charging the bike. The stator component of the inner rider only runs the engine. It uh, pretty much from that point disconnects the electrical system of the bike, of the engine, sorry, from the rest of the bike. Now what can be a little bit frustrating is you no longer have your lights. Because on the factory stator there's a lighting coil that powers the lights. So what we've done, you'll see here it's sort of taped up so it's difficult to tell, but this is the factory... Um, stator plug that normally plugs into the stator, a little six pin plug. These are often a bit of a headache for Piaggio engines because they can commonly have some connection issues and cause a spark issue. Now, what I've done here, you'll see there's a little wire going into it just there. That there is essentially just a, a little tab pin that I've connected, which wires up to a switch up here. Basically all this does is uh, that coil there is obviously on the bike side. That's where the power from the stator goes into that pin of the plug and powers the lighting for the bike. Now, because we're not running a factory stator, there's no power going into that other than uh, this cable, which I've rigged up. So essentially, this is just a, uh, a, a positive, um, a wire going from the positive terminal of the battery up to a switch, which I've located up here, then back down into there. So basically, essentially what it does is allows you to run all the factory lights, including the tail light, via this little switch, which you normally wouldn't be able to do running an inner rider. Now, obviously, it's fairly essential being able to um, use your lights on the road, uh, in, unless you're using it as a dedicated race bike. So this uh, cheap, easy little hack here just allows you to be able to run an inner rider ignition, but um, with, um, with all the factory lights working as normal. Now, as with the lights, because the stator isn't providing any charge to the battery either, um, we've upgraded the size of the battery and also put a gel battery in there. So it uh, gets a bit more life between charges, but with a setup like this, you do need to run uh, a charger when you're not um, riding the bike. It's a good idea probably just to have some little connectors on there that you can sort of quick connect up when you're not um, riding the bike. That way it just puts a bit of trickle charge into the battery and keeps it charged up because it's not receiving that charge like it normally would from the factory stator. Now you see this tucked down here is a beautiful Molossi Digitronic CDI. This is the one that comes with the MHR uh, Team 2 inner rotor. Back in the day when I put, um, a few years ago, I put a Molossi um, inner rotor on my own personal scooter. This didn't come with this adjustable CDI. You had to buy it separately. It was quite expensive. They come with them now, which is great. Now you see there's quite a bit of adjustment here. Um, these ones have three different adjustments. So one is the mapping mode. So depending on the cylinder kit that you've got, Molossi do give you a chart of uh, what map um, it, they suggest. Now the difference in these maps is um, advanced timing. So at different RPMs, Molossi uh, have essentially different tune settings. So it'll run a different level of advance depending on the RPM according to what Molossi um, have sort of designated each particular cylinder kit will run uh, better at. When you look at the chart in the book, it's really quite complicated. Now, this one here I've just put at zero, which is a static, what they call a, a static advance. So I believe it's somewhere in the range of about 15 degrees or something like that. Static advance all the time running 15 degrees, which I found works best on this cylinder kit. It did run a little bit wonky on some of the other tuning uh, settings, but depending on which cylinder kit you have, um, <clears throat> it will run differently. It's also what you're doing with the bike too. If you're doing drag racing or something, you might have a more aggressive um, uh, setup because you're not sort of looking to be able to pull up at, at the lights and that sort of thing and idle nicely. It just seemed to idle a little bit oddly on some of the different settings. Now, the offset is uh, for timing. So I mentioned that it's quite complicated or very essential getting the um, the timing of the inner rotor set up and the way that it's adjustable as it bolts on. And the offset allows you to adjust plus or minus, I think somewhere in the range of about two degrees or something. If you think that maybe you've gotten the timing wrong, um, you can adjust it um, plus or minus two degrees. Uh, again, in the Molossi instructional book, they tell you uh, which number corresponds to which um, sort of timing offset. I've got it at zero because I was quite confident that I got it at the right level. Now here you have the limiter. This is quite cool. I've got this set at setting F, which is no limit. 
but um, you can again the lossy book tells you all the what these different uh, letters and numbers correspond to in terms of a limit I think it allows you an adjustment from somewhere around 10 or 11,000 all the way up to say 14,000 I found with this particular bike on setting E which was 14,000 it was still um, hitting the limit so obviously there's a very very high revving cylinder kit um, again in this particular instance we're not using it but um, if you were looking to preserve the engine for say uh, you, were, you were racing on a track and you're looking to preserve the engine for a little bit longer if it was under quite a hard workload for a long time maybe you would use the um, the limiter just to allow the engine not to rev past a certain level because this is a daily rider it's not like it's getting its absolute brains thrashed out all the time so you're able just to be a little bit sympathetic to, um, to the engine just by backing off uh, periodically as you need to so it can um, cool back down. Now you might might, might notice there's an, uh, two switches. So uh, one of these switches is the kill switch for the inner rider. So this little, I think it's actually the yellow wire, um, once it's connected to earth, turns the engine off. Now a little bit unusual with these, because the inner rider disconnects itself from the rest of the electrical system of the bike, when you turn the key off, the bike doesn't turn off. So that's what that yellow wire is for. So Melossi suggests that you connect it to a switch, which is exactly what I've done. Just one of these little waterproof switches here. So when you want to turn the engine on, you flick the switch down. That one's actually for the light, sorry. Flick the switch down. And then when you want to turn it off, flick the switch up. So I just got them wired up in a fairly logical, easy to use way. So both switches down means running. So lights on, engine on. Both switches up means engine off, lights off. All right, I'll give her a crank up, see how she sounds. Check on, yep, all right. Runs and idles quite nicely. I had those a little bit technical, guys, and I apologise. But um, obviously, with a bike like this, it does start to get a bit technical because you've got quite a lot of sort of high end technical components installed. So, just wanted to be as detail oriented as possible. But when it comes down to sort of numbers that most people care about, how quick does it go? It's doing somewhere in the range of about 130. Uh, and I'd say it's probably getting to a hundred, although I've not timed it, probably somewhere in the range of like maybe five seconds. It's really fast. Uh, I'd say the biggest restrictor is getting it to accelerate quickly without lifting the front wheel. It's really scary. This is easily the scariest bike that I've ridden. Um, even the customer <laughs> has his mates riding it and um, they um, sort of are quite scared after riding it too. It's really properly, properly fast. I doubt there's many cars even that would get you off the line if you were trying to drag race them up to 100 k's an hour, it'll pretty much uh, destroy anything. It's it's really properly fast, not just scooter fast. Something else I did forget to mention uh, is it does have a stage six uh, shock installed on the rear as well. It's one of the ones with the uh, external uh, chamber, a little reservoir, which has made an enormous difference to the way these handle. The factory shocks on the front on these are really quite good. Um, the big thing that you'll notice between the SR and some of the other models um, of scooters is the handling on the SR is absolutely beautiful. Um, the big letdown is the rear shock from factory is way too soft. Now um, the, uh, the stage six on this happened to come up for sale at the time that the customer was looking to buy one. And um, so he picked it up and I've got to say, I've ridden uh, quite a lot of SRs with quite a lot of rear uh, aftermarket rear shocks installed. And this stage six is by far the best. Uh, I've not ridden a Melossi uh, RS24, um, which was the other sort of big contender to the stage six, but the Melossi is, so expensive um, so the stage six was sort of a really great option for him at the time and um geez it is a really fantastic performing shock thanks for watching guys that we appreciate it hopefully we've answered most of the questions that you have if you do have some more let us know we'll be happy to answer but um all around this bike has uh, come out fantastic one of the best that we've probably built and um we're really happy with it but um, more importantly the customer is stoked with it so that's uh, that's what really matters at the end of the day thanks again for watching guys